lawmakers woke up and realized that if they were going to save America from a global pandemic, they needed the voice. This is very important in today's current events. They needed the voice of the largest revitalized, most relevant Hispanic business organization in this country, your United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. There's only one. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my slides. I gave you all a deck, not because I'm gonna read off of it and go through it, because I can't even see the PowerPoint, but because I wanted you to have an example of what we use to do advocacy. And I wanted you all to have data at your disposal so that you all could use it as needed. And I already made some updates to it, so we'll get you a new electronic version next week. Um, but I did want to call your attention to the fact that our board of directors, and thank you to those of you who are in the room today and at this training, Mr. Ernie Cidevaca, Mayra Pineda, and Jennifer Rodriguez, we're so fortunate and blessed um, to have chambers on our board because that is where the real work is of the USHCC in my humble opinion. Um, I've been visiting chambers like the last 60 days uh, when we got here with Peter in July and it's, it's so telling how our chambers on the ground, their business members really translate into the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis at the USHCC. Um, I've been, I, Peter and I have been to visit businesses here in Las Vegas. Um, I visited El Paso in commemoration of the El Paso shooting and visited businesses there with Cindy Ramos Davidson, which many of you know. And last week I visited affected businesses in Phoenix, we just got in line with Mr. Mejia to visit affected businesses in the state of Rhode Island. And we must continue the tour in order so that this mission and this vision on your screen that was recently updated by our board of directors can really take shape in this country. And so that we can start not demanding, but rightfully taking our seats at the decision-making tables of America. Because we're not asking for a handout. My grandfather used to always say, a mí no me des, a mí ponme donde hay. And that's very telling of our community because we aren't asking for handouts. It's what's ours, it belongs to us. And if you continue to look at the numbers, and go through these slides, you continue to realize that we hold the buying power, we hold the jobs, we hold consumer exports and imports, we hold the buying power. The 2020 US Census says that there are 62 million Latinos in this country. The USHCC is putting together an uh, a coalition right now to tell the US Census, you're wrong. There are not 62 million Latinos in this country. What did you do with the 750,000 dreamers that are seeking status in this country and that have lived in the shadows of our immigration system? What are you doing with the more than 1.5 million asylum seekers that are at the US-Mexico border from Haiti and from the Central American Triangle who are seeking asylum in this country? And what have you done with all of those parents of those dreamers who have lived in the shadows for more than 20 years trying to seek a path to citizenship? So in a conservative estimate, it is the opinion of the coalition that there are really 63.5 million Latinos living in America, which is about 1.5 million more than what the U.S. Census um, estimated and i'll give you another example in rural south texas where i'm from in cameron county a county that has grown exponentially because of the elon musk boom down in brownsville texas they only reported an increase of 4200 residents the county judge and i looked at each other and we were appalled 
And so how many more counties in rural America undercounted Latinos, undercounted uh, immigrants who are seeking legal status, undercounted dreamers going to our local commuter universities. So we have to, all that comes into being doing advocacy work, doing coalition building, which is what this session is about. Um, and so I kind of want to get to that with, with kind of these stories, but I also want this to be an interactive discussion. So if y'all have any questions, just flag me so that y'all can interrupt me and I'm glad to answer any questions. Those of you that know me, you know that I always keep it 100 with everybody. So you'll pretty get, get, a, get a pretty frank and straightforward answer from me 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, so the state of Latino business, so this is a bunch of research that we use in our advocacy, but I want to get to this part, defining Hispanic businesses advocacy priorities and what we've learned during the pandemic through COVID and before COVID, some of these are the existential problems that we see that small businesses and Latino businesses face on an everyday basis. And these are the, the, the these are kind of the framework in which we have done advocacy. Um, when the pandemic started, everyone was like, what do we do? What do we do? Like no one knew what to do. And so people started writing advocacy letters. And so if you go to our website, I think we've sent over 75 advocacy letters to Congress over the last 18 months advocating for different things that have to do with growing Latino businesses. Um, and not all of it has fallen on deaf ears. You know, um, many of you know that the USHCC fought hard for the inclusion of 501c6s and c3s into um, into the CARES Act funding for paycheck protection loans. That, that happened, let, let me tell you how that happened. Um, I have the honor and privilege of being the chairman of the Texas Border Coalition. And somebody on one of our calls invited Senator Cruz to speak. And I told Senator Cruz, your Texas chambers need PPP funding. And Senator Cruz turned around and wrote an amendment and it gained legs and it went and like 62 days later, we were approved. This was like in July, August of, of, of last year. And we were amazed, right? Because if you're from Texas and you know Ted Cruz, I mean, there's some certain reservations, but the USHCC is a nonpartisan organization. So we play ball with everybody. Regardless if we have to play ball with them at the Las Vegas airport or at the Cancun airport, but we play ball with them. And so um, that's how that happened. And so the whole thing of being part of a coalition led to this conversation just coming up. And then the other thing that I know is very important to you guys, which we were very involved in is why aren't large corporate banks in this country prepared to serve Latinos? Why did the financial, the largest financial institutions in America shut their doors to our people when we were all customers, when we all invested money? And what I tell people is that we have to work with banks because they're the ones that have the money. What happened to the banks, in my professional opinion, was a lack of systemic bureaucracy at the Department of Treasury that didn't allow those banks to adequately give this money to people, not just Latinos, I mean, people in general. And so how did we pivot from that? Well, can't get into the big banks. We need CDFIs, we need MDIs. And we started working with Congresswoman Waters and with, with um, Nidia Velasquez to file an amendment to the, to the CARES Act to allocate and appropriate an additional $60 billion that was exclusive lending for community financial development institutions and MDIs. And it got approved. It took 43 days, but it got approved. 
And so now you had all these rural financial institutions being able to lend out this money. And that was, that was another success during the pandemic. During the pandemic, you had to take little successes as they came because, um, you know, you, you had to divorce the antics of the White House media briefing room. You had to meet with congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle. You had to do advocacy. And at the end of the day, you just had to pray and hope that something was going to happen. Whether it was what you asked for or whether it was a variation of that. Because we, we're, li we're still living in an unprecedented time in America. So we didn't know. Nobody knew. Congress didn't know. So um, it was a very fine line for an organization like the USHCC to walk. And it was one that we walked very diligently. Um, and it was one that we walked with each and every one of you in mind. With each and every one of your business members in mind. Because we believe that your chambers became the emergency rooms for small businesses across this country. And we believe that because of those chamber emergency rooms, as I like to call them, that that is why either Latino businesses rebuilt, Latino businesses got PPP loans, Latino businesses secured economic injury disaster loans, restaurants uh, got restaurant revitalization funding, that is why Latino businesses continue to open up. That is why the creative industry in the Latino community boomed. That is why now we have more than 40% of Latino businesses on digital platforms when they didn't used to be. That is why people were able to be reemployed and put food on their family's table. And all of that happened because we made a concerted decision to work with whoever was willing to listen to us. Because as I like to say, and as Ramiro likes to say, we're not, we're, we're, we're not red or blue at the USHCC. We're red, white, and blue. And our favorite color is green. And so, that, that was kind of the mindset. And that's what we fledged forward with to do the advocacy work um, that continues during the pandemic. Um, so each of these, you know, each of, each of these priorities has different data attached to them. It has different, but one thing that I do wanna touch on, cause I know it's an existential thing and it's been around forever is access to capital. And how do we bridge that gap of, of accessing capital, um, which is on this page? Well, I'm going to talk about private sector contracting. But first, accessing capital and education. We have to continue to work with the banks. We have to marry the idea that we need to put more Latinos into positions of power when it comes to equity and venture capitalist funding. We have to grow that ecosystem. We have to be of the idea that our community is not the best at financial security and mapping out our financial future. And it is our social and economic responsibility to teach your business members how to do that. How do I have clean books? How do I hire a CPA? How do I pay my quarterlies on time? How do I access government funding? A lot of businesses are, are fearful of the government. I, I, there's so many businesses, Libra, I didn't get PPP. What do I do? I said, sign up for EIDL. I don't want a loan from the government. Why not? $150,000 on a 30-year fixed 2% interest. And we just asked Congress to defer all payments till January 2024. Why not? This is free money. And so that education, that technical assistance, that's, and, and that's going all the way to the root of the problem. So while people want to talk about que los bancos nos cerraron las puertas, 
que a nosotros nunca nos dan dinero, que, you know, nobody wants to talk about access to capital or grow the ecosystem in the Latino community. It starts with fundamentals. It starts with education. It starts with having sound financial health. And so we have to, that's something we have to do. Luckily for us, we were able to do some of that work with some of you in the room through the Minority Business Development Agency and a grant that we got, one of the first federal grants given to the USHCC in its 42 year history under this administration and our board of directors. Um, and those are the things we, we have to continue to do that, right? Um, and then I wanna talk about this, the, the, the federal contracts part. It's hard. Again, a technical assistance capacity building piece. And unfortunately, this is the only part of the presentation where I'm going to give you bad news. Okay? But you need to know. Because if we don't know, we cannot create systemic paradigm shifts in the federal government. So it is my responsibility as your vice president of government international affairs to let you know that before Donald Trump took office, there was 146,000 registered minority owned businesses with the SBA. As of September 1st, there's only 84,000. So we lost about 65,000 in a four year period. And I say minority business enterprises, because remember another hurdle with this is that the SBA does not break us out by ethnic group. So we don't know how many African Americans, we don't know how many Asian Americans, we don't know how many women, we don't know how many veteran, we don't know how many Latinos. That's another problem that we have to tackle with, with this, with SBA. But the fact, and, and, and the other day somebody said, well, why, why did we lose? How did we lose? Six, almost 65,000 registered SBEs. I'll tell you how. That administration decided that federal procurement needed to be bundled and started buying services and commodities from consortium-like esque companies where instead of buying something from you and something from you and something from you and something from Ernie and something from my and something from Esperanza, they started buying everything from Hope. Because Hope sold everything that the rest of you sold. And thus, over a four-year period, eliminated the capacity and registration of 65,000, almost 65,000 small, I mean, uh, minority business enterprises. So we have to get these people registered again or get more businesses that, that, that fall. So right now, there's negotiations. So we have to retract. The consortium buying has to stop. That's one, that's one piece. Second, we have to get somebody to listen to us in Congress to get ethnic minorities counted individually in this category when it comes to federal procurement. That's the second thing. The third thing is we have to create, like I was hearing earlier, the programs that you all create, create federal capacity building contracting registration programs in our communities. That's the fourth thing. The fifth thing is we have to hold this current administration accountable because there's now an executive order that mandates federal agencies to go from 5% in minority business enterprise spending to 15%. But who's holding the line on that? So we, that's the fifth thing, holding this administration accountable and that, that, that the executive order transfers into bureaucracy, that it happens, that it's not just something that the president said and signed and it, it doesn't happen. So we have, to, we have to make sure to hold people accountable. Um, that's the fifth thing. And then the sixth thing is that we have to be able to identify. Um, very important. We have to be able to identify what businesses in our communities are prepared and able to do business with the federal government, are adequately bonded and insured, and then which ones need help, which ones have the ability to scale up to that level. 
and help them scale. That's the sixth part. I know this is a long process, but it's, it's bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is long. And then the seventh thing is, is we have to make sure to continue to sound the alarm. Not just us at the federal level. We need each and every one of you sounding the alarm. Because this is not just a federal thing. This is a thing in your individual states and in your individual communities when it comes to city ordinances, uh, the county buying from your business members, the state buying, the city buying. It, it, it's all a bottom-up effect or a top-down effect, however you want to look at it. But this, this starts in us continuing to sound the alarm. And not sound the alarm, like I said earlier, in that we need a handout. We don't need a handout. We are the future of this country. We don't need a handout. We are the labor workforce in this country. They need us. We don't need them. You're in a city where the hospitality industry is predominantly worked by the Latino community. And in order for this community to revitalize, it needs Latinos. I thought Peter could tell you. And, and that's part of the reason why we're here. A lot of people say, why Las Vegas? Because the, we understood that the revitalization of this community for our gente was so critical because it had been hurt so much. And who wants to go to Florida? Um, and so that's, that's, you know, that's kind of why we're here, right? And so that's the federal contracting piece. So there's a lot of advocacy to be done on this piece when it comes with, to, with the SBA, when it comes to the office of OMB, when it comes to holding this White House accountable for what it said it's gonna do in executive order, there's a lot of advocacy to be done here. But the good thing is, again, I revert. I, I wanna remind everybody that they're calling us, that the model changed. We are no longer calling them. We are no longer saying, hey, come have dinner with us. And let me invite a lobbyist to pay for that dinner. Those days are over. We're saving money. Yeah, those days are over. I Cope knows this. I used to do that for Coca-Cola. I used to be the lobbyist that used to show up when a chamber needed to meet a member of Congress to drop my card. So those days are gone because one, we're virtual. Two, if you don't have a federal employee badge, you can't get into any building on Capitol Hill. And three, America woke up and they realized that they need the voice of the Latino community at the table, of the Asian American community at the table, of the black community at the table, African Americans. So I don't know the ramifications of that awakening because this pandemic is still not over. So I'm, I just turned 36. I anticipate that in the next decade, by the time I'm 50, in the next 14 years, we will have history books that talk about what we are talking about here today, right? And, and, and there'll be scholars that'll tell us what we did right and what we did wrong. And I am of the opinion that people are going to talk very positively about Latinos. Why? Because we rose to the occasion. Latinos have worked the front lines the most. Latinos have been affected by the pandemic the most. But Latinos are bouncing back the fastest. Latinos are growing the fastest. And we have the consumer buying power that other communities don't have. So I think that the history books are going to write a good story about us. Because the resiliency of our community is dependent on economics. Not on, not on, not, yes, there are racial equities issues there. Um, and, and, and I think that a lot of people with the different social movements in our country and what we have seen during the pandemic um, have lev other communities have leveraged that, but we haven't had to because economics is on our side. And that's a good thing. 
Um, and we have to keep professing that. It's all about the numbers. This is not, uh, this, this is not a, it, it, you can turn it into a social issue, but for the United States Hispanic Chamber, it's a business issue. It's, a, it's an issue of economics. It's who we are. It's who we have been since like the 90s when the Latino population took a big boom. And it's who we are yet to be as a community. So I wanna leave some time for questions. I already talked about technical assistance and capacity building. I wanna to touch on broadband and technology real quick because this is real important. We're on a coalition, Hispanics and technology and telecommunication. And, and I encourage each and every one of you find the coalitions. I'm gonna show you all a slide here at the end that's very interesting. But we started a campaign on EBB para mi. Emergency Broadband Benefit Para Mi was the name of the campaign. We led it with some of our national partners. And now the Emergency Broadband, broadband Benefit has been extended to rural communities across this country. And it is estimated that more than 40 million Latinos now have access to broadband who either got their broadband or their internet from a smartphone or didn't have it at all. And the other thing is having access to adequate technology. Again, the fundamentals. Back to the fundamentals. You can't get a good education on a smartphone. You can't retrieve medical records on a smartphone. You can't, you can't have a, a, a sound financial picture in front of you on a smartphone. And so having access to technology, and now with this new legislation that just passed, there's a huge amount of money in there for teleco companies, um, which are all proud corporate members of the USHCC, and I'm sure a lot of your chambers, to be able to give out technology to customers and have them incentivized. Give it to them pretty much for free or at a very low cost. So the technology piece is so important um, and the whole thing about broadband infrastructure is so critical. So um, we're, we're, we continue to do this work through coalitions like HTTP and the uh, Wireless Association. And there, there are several out there at a national level. But 5G and broadband, that's where it's at. And our Latino businesses need it so much because now, as I said earlier, a lot of them went from serving, from serving their customers in person to now serving their customers digitally. So if we continue to arm our members with the ability of digitization, and if we continue to work with corporations to um, evolve broadband infrastructure in America and 5G network capability. And if we are able to eliminate government bureaucracy that doesn't allow this to happen, then a lot of people are going to get more online. And a lot of people are going to be able to uh, sell their services and products online. Um, Investing, so I wanted to talk about workforce development because I think I mentioned it earlier um, with uh, about the comment I made about Las Vegas. But the other thing that I'm very passionate about and that I like to talk about a lot is the power of the pen and the power of the purse. Another thing we need to continue sounding the alarm on in your individual communities. It is time. It has been time. It was probably time when I was like 10 years old for Latinos and Latinas, especially Latinas, to have their rightful seat in corporate American boardrooms in this country, on boards and commissions in each of your states and in the halls of Congress. We need, we, we need Congress to look like this country. And we need more women in positions of power in order so that they can have the power of the pen and the power of the purse to write our business members' contracts and checks. And we need to tell corporate America, and I'm a corporate guy, I work for a chamber, so do all of you. 
But we need to tell corporate America, I don't care how much money you're awarding. You can award a trillion dollars if you want. I want to know how much money went out of your checkbook the last day of your fiscal year. That's what I want to know. So asking those questions the right way is what's going to get us there. Because any corporation can tell you, oh, I awarded a billion dollars, you know, to, to minority businesses. But that award never transferred into dollars into those businesses' bank accounts. So I don't care how much people award. I want to know how much was paid out. And if we put more people that look like us in boardrooms and in C-suite positions, um, we will be able to have more power over that number. Uh, and, and the reason that I, um, I acclaim and I applaud my sisters in this fight is because Latinas are starting businesses at three times the rate. So it only makes sense that Latinas also ascend into positions of power because they're going to help that respective sector that's growing in this country, empowering our economy. And so um, I don't say it lightly. I say it because I truly believe that the leadership face of the American Latine community is female. And I wholeheartedly believe that um, because the numbers are there to prove it. And so ladies, if you're not on a board in your communities, if you're not appointed by your governor to a state border commission, you let the USHCC know so we can write you a letter of support. And if you have the uh, want to be on a corporate board in your state, you let the USHCC know. And if you have the want to run for political office, let us know so we can find someone to help you fundraise money because I can't get involved in that. But I'm sure we know people who know people. And so, um, so that, 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 that's one, that one thing that I wanted to touch on. So moving on, I already talked about this. This is our framework. This is how we did advocacy during the pandemic. One of the really cool things, all of these people that you see on the screen, I mean, if, if they had been around USHCC before, I didn't know about it. I had been coming to USHCC conferences since 2012 and legislative summits since 2014. Now all these people are knocking on our door. And a lot of people say, well, it's because, you know, uh, the administration changed. No, no, I had all these people on speed dial during Trump too. It's, it, it, it's not about politics. It's about them needing us to formulate an opinion in Congress to create change in America. And that's where you divorce politics from policy. And you make it a policy argument, an advocacy argument, not a red or blue argument. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm very humbled to uh, serve in the role that I serve in and to know, because Peter alluded to it earlier about chambers getting involved in politics. And I, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that we can be politically involved, but we have to be politically involved for the right reasons. And we cannot pick sides because, because we are not going to advance a community by picking sides. We are going to advance a community by working in, on both sides of the aisle, by collaborating with all people and um, I'm very proud that this new administration at USHCC under the leadership of Ramiro over the last three years um, has been able to do good advocacy work without having to endorse anybody. Last year, a year ago, you all attended this conference virtually. It's a very different world. Joe Biden was there. He was running for president. Que, mi, que milagro. Fíjate. 
I want, a lot of people don't know this. We're the only national chamber of commerce that didn't formally endorse him. He was endorsed by the Asian American Chamber. He was endorsed by the National Black Chamber, by Black Chambers, Inc. He was endorsed by the NGLCC. We didn't endorse him. Still gave us six minutes of his time. Still sent now Ambassador Ken Salazar to be his surrogate. And again, why? Because they need us. No son nada sin nosotros. And they know it. So the new, the new USHCC does not endorse presidential candidates, y'all know. And, um, but we still, we still have a seat at the table. And that's what's important, is that seat at the table. Um, I want to highlight this. When I got to, when I, when I came from Coca-Cola, we used Quorum at Coca-Cola. And one of the first things I asked Ramiro and Felipe when we came to work uh, in Washington, I said, I need this program. Like, there's, uh, there's no way we can do without it. And I want to offer it to you guys, our, our chamber members. Um, we have the federal version of Quorum, but basically what you see here is a stakeholder map. I use John Cornyn as an example because he's my senator from Texas. But basically, this allows me to know who John Cornyn is close to, who's on his staff, what committees he serves on, what positions he's taken in legislation. Um, it gives you a bunch of political data and who he's closest to in case you ever need a favor that he's not willing to do for you. Um, and then the other thing that this does is now that USHCC has been on this platform, let's see, we got it in February, so about 18 months now, um, US, the USHCC or the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce or the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has been mentioned in congressional briefs, congressional testimonies, advocacy letters to Congress, or briefings by any member of Congress to any administration official within the government more than a quarter of a million times. We've been mentioned more than 250,000 times. I just checked on Thursday. So this advocacy tool has really allowed us to grow our advocacy. This advocacy tool has the uh, ability to also do state stuff. Um, if it's something that one of your corporate members can pay for, or that you all can get a grant for, like a technology grant. That's how we did it. We got a technology grant to buy into Quorum. It's, I don't think it's very expensive. I use it every day at the chamber to look stuff up, bills, follow legislation. Like if Peter calls me or Ernie calls me or Maida calls me and says, hey, what do you know about this? I go in there, I, I type it in and I start tracking it. And I start getting all these alerts on that legislation and where it's moving to and what committee and if it's past committee and it, it sends me all kinds of data. And then I don't have to ever call a lobbyist anymore in Washington and ask for somebody's phone number. It's here. Um, so we, we, um, we got a grant for this right now. I think we, we, we pay like $15,000 a year for this tool. Um, it was founded, uh, this tool quorum was founded by a guy who went to Harvard and um, kind of ran in that Mark Zuckerberg circle, but um, he was real into politics because he had worked on the Hill. And so he's a good friend of the Coca-Cola company. And, and we've used Quorum at the USHCC now for 18 months. So what I'm offering to you is if you ever need anything related to your members of Congress or your senators that the USHCC can provide for you, please don't hesitate to call us. You're looking for a chief of staff. You're looking for a policy director in somebody's office. Call, call us. We'll help you get that information out of here. It even has the ability like, Leroy, I just want to know more about my senator. I can send you all of their biographical information. I even have the, the names of their children in there. And, it, and also, uh, so the other thing that's really helpful it also has all the government agencies. So if you ever need a contact at the Department of Commerce, I know a lot of you get MBDA money or EDA grants from, from Commerce. If you need a contact at Treasury, if you need a contact at Small Business Administration, everybody's email is in their contact number when they started, you know, their age, their marital status, what party they belong to. It gives you a world 
It doesn't tell you where they have coffee, but it is a world of information. And we, we, now that we've used it and we've gotten acquainted with it and we have government affairs support through Santiago, who's on our team. I'm sure a lot of you have interacted with Santiago. I don't think he's in the room right now, but um, Santiago is a genie at this at, at quorum and, and can definitely help your chambers get the information that you need. This is just another thing that we want to know, let you know that we have to help you out in your communities. And then I'm gonna end with uh, these last two slides and I think I'm gonna be right on time with 10 minutes for questions. We, it's time to update our public, our public policy platform. It was published at this year's legislative summit. We're publishing a new one in 2022. Legislative summit dates have been set March 29th through March 31st in Washington, DC. Um, so if there's any legislation out there that you particularly care to go into this public policy platform, um, that's another thing. This new administration, we take feedback. Send me an email. Let's set up a call. Let's talk about your federal issues in your states and in your cities. And we'll be glad to take it to government affairs and get it vetted and include it because that's what this policy platform is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be inclusive of the members of the USHCC. Um, and so I'll be updating this quick timeline, Q4, update, January, take it to government affairs, have a pre-approval, redraft, February 1st, take it back to government affairs, get a final approval, it'll be published for you guys um, at, the, at, the, at the legislative summit in March. And things have changed. This document is a living, breathing document, but things have changed, you know? We're no longer, there's different things we have to advocate for. And with the new administration, they've put out new things that we gotta look at as a community and hold them accountable for. So this document will change a, a bit in 2022, just because the world has changed. And then the last and most important thing is I already talked about the ascension of women, but Proyecto 20% is something that we've been a part of with, again, coalition building, all those logos you see at the bottom of the screen to get more Latinos appointed to government positions uh, with the Biden administration. Where are we at on this? We sit at 8%. We want 20. 8%. We want 4,000 political appointments. And I think we're there. Kathy Russell gets it at the White House. We've met with her several times, and I think she gets it. There's still about 2,000 unfilled Biden-Harris political appointments. If you know any Latinos or Latinas who want to be appointed to the administration, the USHCC is here to help. We have an endorsement process. This USHCC believes in good governance. We have a committee to vet these things out, review resumes, draft letters. We're here to help. We need more representation in government. And then this slide, this is the holy grail, and it's not fully updated, but when we talk about coalition building, these are all, or most of, I would say about 95% of the different organizations that USHCC has become a part of in the last three years, has brought back to the table or to the ranch, as I like to say, in the last three years, or that we do joint advocacy with, or that we have a, a joint program with in some way or another. And I, I, I challenge every time I show this slide, because I present this deck a lot to different organizations, when I challenge each and every one of you, go back home and make a similar slide like this. And you'd be surprised how many allies and partners you have in your communities that you are currently not leveraging. We can't all do the same thing, right? We all do different things. And as chambers of commerce, our role is business. Um, and so we have to leverage other people to get things done. And we have to bring other people, right? So I'll end with these two things. I don't believe in bringing people up behind me. I believe in bringing people up to stand beside me. So we're here. 
We're in Las Vegas. Let's stand together. Let's stay healthy. Let's stay safe. And let's continue to evolve Hispanic business because it is the insurance of American economic vitality. And that's it. Questions? Thank Lero, thank you very much. Great presentation and congrats to you, uh, Ramiro and everybody on the team and all the great work you guys are doing. Um, another applause for him and the rest of the team. So I, I was just curious um, on those numbers that you mentioned on the procurement, because I totally agree with you that procurement is, is one of those uh, um, challenges, but a, an opportunity too, that we need to raise that up. Um, on the numbers that went down, what division of SBA was that coming from? Or I was just curious, because certainly would love to help on that part too. Like when, like when they decrease the numbers, you mean in the in the contractors? Yeah, where yeah. did that come from? It, it came from well, obviously, when you consortium buy, you save money, right? If you buy something in a bundle, it's a lot cheaper than buying something from you, something from him, something from her, right? So part of it was cost savings, but. It, 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 if you look at the flip side of that, how much sense does that make? Because by eliminating those businesses, you could have eliminated jobs. I mean, one federal contract can make or break a business for decades. It means the difference between Peter, one of Peter's members or one of Ernie's members having 10 people on the payroll or 80 people on the payroll. So that's, that, it was a cost savings measure. Oh, okay, I was curious about the, the other two things I was going to say on that part too is that I think that from a macro level, definitely in, in terms of pushing any administration and, and federal government to increase the size for more opportunities for our small businesses in the Hispanic community. But I think the interesting factoid too is there's two agencies in the federal government that make a lot of purchasing powers for all, all the ones that are the ones that resist the most, and that's uh. Department of Defense and Department of Transportation. So I, I think that there's an opportunity for us as a community to come together and put more pressure on them in that aspect as well. Absolutely, especially transportation with this new infrastructure bill that has been passed where we are in, the, uh, in talks with their Office of Procurement and how they're going to roll all this out to you all's communities, especially communities who got large amounts of money allocated to them for infrastructure. We need to make sure, and, and I, I tell you guys this, and I'm not apologetic about this. Henry B. Gonzalez always said, I'm an American without prefix, without suffix, and without apology. And, and I'm, I'm unapologetic that, that it, we, are, we are done, Latinos are done with being subcontractors. We have the capability and the ability to be primes in this country. Anybody else have any questions? Hi, my name is Ishiel with the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I don't know how political, politically charged this question is, but um, I would, I'm curious to see what your opinion is in regards to immigration reform and the shortage of labor that there is right now. Uh, as a chamber, what are the things that you say that you comment in regards to this topic? We, um, we put together uh, an unemployment brief a few months ago uh, in May that I can definitely share with you. We are aware of the unemployment shortage, of the, of the employment shortage in this country. I think those are two different questions. The immigration question, it looks like we might get somewhere on immigration or something on immigration with the current reconciliation bill that's being considered. But even yesterday, Congress didn't go home for the weekend. They're still negotiating and horse trading, but it's, it's in there. And at least it's in there. We've never seen it in there. A lot of people promised us it would be in there for years and it's never been. And now it's there. 
So if the reconciliation bill passes, we're not saying we're going to get a clear pathway to citizenship, but we're going to get certain provisions that are going to help like the dreamers, like people who are here on temporary protected status and other things like that that are included in reconciliation. On the unemployment front, I, I think that people are, I think that there's this misnomer out there that people don't want to work. I think that it's more that people don't know how to reintegrate to work. And I think that that's a problem. A lot of states have offered incentives for people to go back to work. A lot of states have cut off unemployment benefits. You know, the federal emergency benefits were ending in September. And I think that if you look at the jobs reports from April, May, June, July, August, they have had certain fluctuations, but after May and June and July, they went up. And so I think that, that a lot of people say, well, people don't want to work, right? And then they want to ping us, our community, as like, we're the lazy community. No, we're not lazy. It's just that I don't think people know how to grapple with the fact of going reintegrating into the workforce. A lot of people have had to change their careers or their jobs. A lot of people, those of you who are parents in the room, have had to watch your children return to school when there's still an active Delta variant in this country and when COVID-19 is still a problem in this country. So I just think it's a reintegration issue, more of, well, people don't want to work. Um, and so I think that we, as Chambers of Commerce, we, we, need to, we need to have workforce development trainings in this country to help people reintegrate and maybe work with community colleges to get people's skill sets realigned to the new economy, because a lot of jobs did disappear during the pandemic. And so the people who left the workforce or who were forced to leave the workforce, their jobs may not even be there anymore. Yeah, and I'm sorry to do a follow up. I meant there are questions from our communities uh, about immigration reform need be getting to be passed or discussed more because of the short shortage of labor. Um, so, you know, like there's missing drivers with CDLs and there is like, so there's a lot of conversation about what is the influence of this with our current immigration reform and the need of that talent, that, that labor. So I just wondered if th there were any real realistic opportunities there in the near future since you're close with this topic. I, I think there are going to be definitely, especially if, if the reconciliation bill passes temporary protected status for people who are already here, those people will be obviously part of the workforce labor that you're talking about. So I think that we got to wait. I think that this reconciliation bill is going to take like another 30 to 45 days to negotiate, and it's going to be what Congress does um, before we all break the neck of our Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Veronica Maldonado Torres, uh, President CEO of the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, issues on my team. Um, excited to see here and also the stats about Georgia obviously growing in influence uh, with uh, entrepreneurship. We recently formed the uh, part of a consortium of the Georgia Minority Infrastructure Alliance, specifically to be a part of the conversation about the dollars coming into the market. Um, I'm about 90 days into my role and uh, previously worked for the Georgia Minority Supplier Development Council, part of the NMSDC, did that for about 10 years. And one of the things on the flip side of working at the chamber that I've seen, because I, I can say I've worked in a place of privilege for about 10 years, and now coming back to my community to see some of the gaps that are existing in order for us to get access to the opportunities, um, part of my question to you is when I look at requirements, whether it's to become an MBE, a WEBE, um, to become a DBE, work with uh, GDOT, um, work with some of these opportunities that are coming to the state federal level, um, a lot of them is a requirement of U.S. citizenship. So my question is, um, and you know, we have residents that have great 
companies in place, but don't have access to some of these opportunities. Just curious as to your thoughts regarding when we have billions of dollars being poured into our community, how is our community supposed to get access to that to change generationally the wealth opportunities within our markets? Just curious. That's a very loaded but good question. And Veronica, congratulations to you on uh, your new role and to the growth of the state of Georgia. It really painted a different political picture for this country in the previous election. So, you know, for whatever it's worth, Georgia is, is on the map and you all are so deserving of of, of, of the work that you're doing there. I'm gonna say for the question that you have is that we, we need to ask for it. We need to ask that residents who are here legally have the ability to compete for contracts because a lot of those people are Latinos. Um, and I think that it's just a, an oversight. No one has brought the issue to the table in a formidable way. And if, if, if we need to do that from an advocacy front, then we need to uh, uh, put our armor on and, and go forth to battle for that. Because I think that you're absolutely right that a lot of people miss out on economic opportunity just because of that. And it's not fair because those people still pay taxes. Those people still have consumers. Those people still deposit. People who deposit into the American economy need to be able to withdraw from it. So, um, Leroy, my question is uh, related to the CRA uh, Modernization Act, and that has been on the works for quite a while. Um, and in the same way that we need data from the SBA uh, that, that itemizes or, or goes really deep into um, products and services in the Latino community and, and really breaking data down by ethnicity, we also need banks to do so. Mm -hmm. So under CRA, they tell you, you know, low moderate income, you know, what banks are giving to small businesses, the housing lending data is disaggregated by ethnic background, but the business lending data is not. So we really only know that banks are giving loans in low and moderate income areas to businesses that have a million dollars or less in revenue, but we don't know how many of those loans are to Hispanics, African Americans, or Asian Americans. And then that really, you know, in advocacy work becomes rather difficult. Right. So Jennifer, thank you for your question. You know, we've been working on advocacy around the Community Reinvestment Act with the OCC under a, an umbrella called Project Reach. And we're part, the USHCC is part of the Business and Commerce Committee. And we're, right now, we're having these conversations with the OCC. The problem with this is, is it, it's going to take time to reform the CRA. It's something that has not been reformed in this country since the 80s. I, I think I was three years old the last time that Congress did anything with the CRA, as far as, like, as, far as big, like a modernization of it. But that is obviously we have to continue, like I said earlier, we have to be working with the big financial institutions in this country because we need the data and we need them to we need banks to stop using CRA as an, a little A plus on their banking report card. And we need them to really fulfill the mandate of the CRA. Um, so I think that we, it's a, it's a two-sided issue. One is on the legislative front with Congress, and then the other one is work continuing to convince banks that, hey, your data can really change the tide.
Leroy. I don't want to be the one who, who took over the chamber training. Se va a enojar Ramiro conmigo. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leroy, for a great presentation. I'm, I'm, I feel very proud uh, to have your voice representing us at, at the national level. Uh, my question for you is related uh, uh, to what my colleagues mentioned, um, access to capital. You know, uh, we are seeing the millions of dollars. We are seeing CDFIs, you know, trying to you come to our communities. Where I come from, the Grand Rapids area in Michigan, West Michigan, over 80% of the business owners are undocumented. So there's no way for them you know, to access those resources. We couldn't uh, help them for uh, with uh, loans with the SBA because of that status. Um, so what I'm asking, you know, CDFIs or others, it's, is there a workaround? Is there a way to advocate you know, at a national level for the creation of different tools that can bring those resources without, without the rest restrictions? Um, so that's, that's the first question. The second one, if you are undocumented, you can't open a bank account, you know, uh, because that has regulations at the national level. So what can we do to advocate, you know, for uh, the, undo the undocumented immigrants? So um, the first question, Alan, can I defer to you on the first question? <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with all due respect, Alan. <laughs> Right. And on the second. I was about to say that. So yeah, I was, I was gonna echo at Jennifer's comment. Some CDFIs will lend to people who have the ITN, um, but we do need to do more advocacy for more banks to accept those type of people. And, but basically folks, again, fundamentals. What do we really need in this country? We need more banks owned by Hispanics. Hey, con eso los dejo. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Great presentation from Leroy. Now y'all know why he's so awesome. Um, so before we adjourn, we do have a little certificate ceremony, but before we get to that point, I promise we're not going to stay till five. We're going to let you all a, a little bit early according to the agenda. We wanted to go around the room and give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves, what chamber you represent, and what city you're located from. So we can go ahead and start here with Mr. Alan Gutierrez. Yeah, we'll pass the mic around. I came here to learn from you guys too. So I, I'm a, a big proponent that, you know, I don't know it all. And I've, I've been blessed to be on national stages and different things, but certainly all that you guys do in your communities 
And I took a lot of notes, to be honest with you, but I'm going, I joined the Maryland Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to really engage and, and take that to the next level and working with the chairman and, and the leadership. So love to learn more about everything you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Hello guys, um, my name is Joe Partida and I'm with the Oakland Latino Chamber of Commerce in Oakland, California. Uh, next year, we're bidding for the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce Convention in Oakland. So you're all invited if we get, we get the convention, okay? We'll see you in, uh, in, uh, in, we'll see you in August in, in Oakland. It passes, thank you. Um, so this has been a very interesting uh, day today because I haven't been to a U.S. Hispanic Chamber co Convention in 17 years. So uh, I think the last one I went to was the one that you had in Anaheim or something like that. So anyhow, so I'm, I'm uh, committed again and I'll start coming back to the U.S. Hispanic activities again. And uh, I'll encourage some of our folks in, uh, in Oakland also to attend. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Edward Bennett. I'm the, uh, I just changed my title, Director of Business Development for the Suazo Business Center um, in Salt Lake City, Utah. We have been around since 2002, and I always have a lot to say, so I'm not going to right now. A lot of folks have already said the things that I wanted to say, so thank you all. I'll be here all weekend. Look me up. I know there was another guy that was from Utah, and he's gone again. Crap. I want to know who he was. So if any of you know his name, let me know, please. Hello, my name is John Sanchez, president of this is County Latino American Chamber of Commerce. And I, uh, we had a discussion, this gentleman and I, that it's been a long time that I have attended this event and I, I missed it, but I left. And when I left was the time that we start, we stopped voting in the different areas. And we, I, I felt that a lot was taken away from us. And I'm looking for that to come back. And many of you, as I could see, that are very young, okay? So you don't remember those days, but this gentleman and I do. So we're hoping that this new, uh, our new chairman will consider that and bringing back our old ways and how we did business. And some of you guys probably remember that. I know Esperanza does, and I know uh, a couple of us do. You, you were there too, right? Thank you. And just to add, um, I know we were short on time, so we could just keep our little speeches a little bit shorter. <laughs> Hi, my name is Heidi Castrillon, and I'm part of the very newly, newly um, Chamber of Commerce in Hudson County, Latino American Chamber of Commerce back in, the, um, in New Jersey, North New Jersey. And um, thank you, thank you, Hope, for organizing this event. And um, I'm very happy that we come back to live event. Thank you. My name is Sharon Courtney here in Las Vegas, Nevada, a visual artist. And I am a big volunteer of the Nashville Chamber of Commerce who supports our wonderful people over there. And we connect all the time. So anyone is welcome to communicate or contact me after this, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karina Garcia. I'm representing the Nashville Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Yuri Kunza, who's the president, couldn't be here, so that's why I'm here. And I'm so glad I'm, I'm learning today. This is my first um, Hispanic Chamber um, in person. La last year, I, I attended virtually. And I'm so glad to see how it is shifting and we're looking for new ways of getting the revenue, which in that way, we can empower our businesses as well. Hi, I'm Melanie Marie Boyer. I'm the executive director of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which is a mouthful. Um, I know I already talked a lot today, but I do want to share one thing. When we had our first event back from COVID in person, you know, I, I mean, I don't know in every other city, but you have to invite politicians multiple times, give them free tickets, give them time to speak, blah, 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 blah. Our first event back, first of all, our, our events used to be maybe 60, 70 people. We had 120 people and eight politicians showed up without being invited. They all paid for tickets and they did not ask me to speak. So we are being seen, we are being heard and hopefully, you know, we're gonna have a more powerful voice soon because I'm gonna keep going. So thank you all. 
Good afternoon. My name is Olivia Rios. Uh, I am with the Los Angeles Latino Chamber of Commerce. We are one of the largest uh, commerce uh, chambers, I should say, in the city, even though we have a lot of subsidies. Um, our group is really powerful. We've been making a lot of movement. We're excited to be here. And I know that I'm here to learn from all of you because you all have great ideas and I'm just, I can't write down fast enough. So, but um, if you need any help, any assistance, you want to know anything about LA, I am your resource. I'm here to help you. I'm your cheerleader. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Myra Pineda. President and CEO of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Louisiana and proud board member for the United States Hispanic Chamber. Thank you to all the speakers and the amazing insight you provided today. Uh, this event never ceases to, to really empower and inspire me and looking forward to a great convention. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ishgale and I am the Vice President of Operations for the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I will let my new and amazing leader speak a little bit about GACC, but I will give you a plug-in about something we did during COVID, which was amazing, which allowed us to see a little bit of the need that our small businesses have, which we already knew, but we end up actually classifying a little bit of our benefits and, and education for our small businesses. And we created four phases for our nonprofit. We have Crecer, Avanzar, eh, eh, Escalar, y Expandir. And they all divide different types of resources because our members don't come all in a cookie cutter. They all have different needs. So operation-wise, we had to pivot and change how we think, you know, and there is a need. They all came to us. They are hungry to know. So we figure we need to also customize our services. So um, if there's any interest in finding out how we're doing that, we're happy to support and help. And we're here to learn the best practices from all of y'all. This is my first time and I'm super excited. Thank you. Hi, I've met you all, Shannon Hawkins of the Albuquerque Espanol Chamber, but I just wanna take a second and say thank you to Hope and Coca-Cola and all the speakers today. We always meet so many new people at this event and it's a great way to build your partnerships, your friendships and your collaborations. So soak it all in the next few days. Thank you, Hope. I am Jennifer Rodriguez from the Hispanic Chamber and I am I was like this not coming because of oh, the COVID whatever, but Hope called and here I am. Uh, hi, Veronica Maldonado Torres with the uh, Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Again, I just mentioned about 90 days in. You know, for me, it's such a blessing to be here because um, I grew up uh, with a Latina business owner watching her every single day. My mother has had a business for over 40 years. She is both a Weeby and MBE. She is the epitome of success. Um, and I'm so grateful to have witnessed her climb and how much hard work she had to endure to get to where she's at today. Um, I bring that energy of her lessons learned, um, having been part of the GMSDC network and now championing minority business, but now championing our Hispanic business community for me is such a blessing and an honor. And uh, I'm bringing that energy to this new role uh, about reimagining the next for our business community. Thank you for sharing your best practices. I know I asked a lot of questions today, but I'm here to soak it all up because we want to take the best back to Georgia and whatever we can do, um, you know, we'll give you that Southern hospitality in the ATL. So thank you so much. And thank you, Hope and Coca-Cola, our hometown. We love y'all. Peter Guzman, president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce, Nevada. We've existed for 48 years. We've had two presidents, my dear founder, who I've known since I was 15 years old, Otto Merida and now myself, and I'm just honored to be here. One last thing, if you don't know him, please Google my friend Wayne Newton, please. <laughs> There's a reason why. Carmen Avello, General Counsel for the Latin Chamber of Commerce here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and you heard plenty from me today, so I'll pass it on. Hi, Angie Ramirez from New Jersey, um, from the Morris County Hispanic American Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce. Um, was the past chair, the chair in 2015. I've been involved with this chamber for many, many years. And um, 
didn't come in for a couple of years because of COVID and a couple of other things, but I'm so glad to be back here. Um, what I see, how, how we are evolving and the things that we are doing is so great for our community. And I'm, I'm so proud of everybody. I think we're doing so, so great as, as, as a Hispanic group. Uh, it's awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, one of the things that I always say is that we want to be the change that we want to see in the world, as Mahatma Gandhi said. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Monica Hernandez. I am the president and CEO for the First Coast Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, what I can say is the first time that I came to the U.S. Um, National Convention in 2018, I came super excited as a treasurer. I learned so much information that I went back to Jacksonville ready to nominate my chamber to be Chamber of the Year. We worked really hard. The organization has been established for 29 years. And all the learnings that I, that I took away from here, I applied them and in 2019, we got the Chamber of the Year. So the only reason why I say that is because all of these learnings that, we, that you guys present to us, they really do mean so much for the different organizations. So thank you. Thank you, Hope and Coca-Cola and Ramiro. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Andres Estrada and I have the honor of serving as chairman of the board for the Latin Chamber of Commerce here in Nevada. I get to work with Peter and Carmen regularly. Welcome. Uh, we're so excited to see you here. We're so excited to have this conference in place. Uh, thank you to the USHCC staff and all the wonderful speakers. And I look forward to connecting with hopefully everyone individually here in the upcoming conference. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Oscar Mejias. I am the founder and CEO of the Rhode Island Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. As you know, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the country, but we have 18% muy mal contados uh, Latino population in the state. I always say that we should be the 20, 22, 25% of the po population in the state. Um, but the population has been growing so accelerated in the last five years, I could say the last 10 years, that I feel that the American community, the financial institution, and even the government, they haven't realized how fast we are growing. Uh, very active in the Latino population, very active in politics and economics. So uh, I, I want to say thank you to everybody here. and um, has been a very, very uh, successful event and I learned today a lot of things. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Guillermo Cisneros, President and CEO of the West Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you all. I am looking forward to, uh, to getting to know you more and, uh, and also to hear what we're doing tonight. Peter, Andres, you have suggestions for us. <laughs> we have plans for y'all, don't worry. Perfect. <laughs> Hello, my name is Marcy Moreno, and I'm a professional volunteer with the Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the better half of the leader next to me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Moreno. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We are um, more Southeast Michigan centric and Guillermo um, leads the, the Western side of the state. But um, it is a real privilege and honor to be here with all of you. Um, I took over the leadership in January of 2020 uh, of our 32-year young Chamber of Commerce uh, coming from uh, corporate life, um, 30 years of procurement, supply chain management, HR, program management, a um, couple of expat assignments in Mexico, and the board uh, decided to take a risk on me, having no nonprofit experience, uh, but I am ready, and I just can't thank the USHCC enough, Brianna. Uh, Ramiro, Leroy, uh, Richard, uh, because I didn't know what I didn't know when I took over last year. When COVID hit, you know, I just went right to the USHCC and started tapping into them for resources um, and, and information and support, and, and uh, the organization's just been tremendous. So thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Al Balakwi. I'm here with the uh, Kansas City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Greater Kansas City. I've served as on that board for the last five years. I was just re, um, re elected back to the board. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I own a company called Labor Max Staffing. What I do is I change people's lives. How I do that is I put them back to work. I have over 1,100 employees 
in Kansas City that was in the hospitality business. And you know what happened last year as in Las Vegas. Uh, this year I turned 68 years old. I'm blessed by what God has blessed me with and now it's my turn to give it back. And I plan to go ahead and go out there and help as many other Hispanic companies as possible to grow their business. I mentor about half a dozen young Hispanic men and women in Kansas City. And we've got about five other businesses we're growing with them right now. And I just hope God gives me another 68 years to keep at it. God bless. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ralph Tejeda. I'm with the Morris County Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce. I'm the chairman. I'm a newbie, uh, fairly, uh, I would say a newbie to, uh, to this chamber business and um, um, I'm happy to, uh, to lead our, um, our chamber. Uh, I too am blessed to have um, Esperanza and Hope uh, part of, uh, of our chamber. Uh, I've learned so much with them. Uh, Esperanza has great vision. Uh, Hope has great resources and is, is, is uh, so intelligent and um, has really helped me along. Uh, I am fortunate to uh, be here with uh, some other members from our board and um, happy to have uh, neighbors like, uh, like John Sanchez and, and, and Heidi from uh, neighboring um, chambers in, in New Jersey. Uh, thank you. This is my first uh, USHCC um, convention or um, conference and it won't be my last. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Pablo Gavita. I'm one of those other members that from the board directors that uh, Ralph's talking about. Um, I'm the Community and Government Relations Director for the Morris County Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce from New Jersey as well. Um, this is my first time also at the at the USHCC uh, National um, Convention, which is amazing. And I'm um, learning a lot and uh, glad to meet you all. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for introducing yourself and in your kind words. So we're going to go ahead and do a little presentation of certificates for completing the workshop. I do want to invite our USHC board members up here if they want to join to get take some pictures. Uh, Ms. Myra Pineda, Jennifer Rodriguez, and Ernie C. De Vaca. And so when I call your name, uh, the photographer will should be coming over here. Senor, si. <laughs> Um, and when you call a name, just come up and you'll get your certificate and you'll take a picture with the lovely Hope, our board members, and Mr. C. Leroy Cavazos Reina. So the first one I want to call up is uh, Sharon Courtney. You can take pictures. Yeah. There we go. There you go. Hey, we want to come up there and. Once we have it set up, then we'll just go down the line the same way. Yes, you gotta be in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So the next person can get ready, Guillermo C. 